Hi there. My name is Michelle McSweeney, and I am the domain manager for the data science domain here at Code Academy. Today, in celebration of National Coding Week, I'm going to take you through a project that you could put into a data science portfolio. So if you are following along with us for the other two live streams this week, um, you saw Ben Stone go through how to make a portfolio um, using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's fantastic, but now you might be wondering, what do I put in that portfolio? You might already know that a portfolio is far and away the most important way that you can show employers what skills you actually have. Um, so we're gonna walk through some types of things and an example of something that you could put into a portfolio. Ideally, um, you would want to be thinking about your portfolio, keeping in mind what types of um, roles you wanna fill. So let's say you are someone who's really interested in answer, answering and asking and answering questions with data, right? If you're like, I just wanna know what's there. I wanna to get to the root of it. I wanna be able to tell people what is going on and what they should use in order to make data-driven decisions, then your portfolio should, fo should focus on answering analytics questions. If, however, you're like, I really wanna do predictive analytics. I'm super excited about machine learning and using data to help guide um, companies and organizations around what they should do based on what happened before, you your portfolio should be focused on machine learning, right? If, however, you're really curious about testing hypotheses and like figuring out why things happened, then your portfolio should focus on A-B testing and causal inference, right? So thinking about that, one thing that across the board, everyone who wants to work with data should have in their portfolio is data cleaning and exploratory data analysis. Everyone needs to be able to do that. It should always be there. And having, that'll naturally be baked into bigger projects that you do, but having a standalone project that shows that you can explore a data set and figure out which variables you, sh you should focus on to begin with, that is going to set you up for success. So that's the kind of project that we're gonna work on today. We're gonna to do an exploratory data analysis of NBA trends, right? So NBA, the National Basketball Association, is an American organization focused on basketball, obviously. Um, and we're gonna look at how a couple of teams have performed, um, what their outcomes are in relationship to whether they're playing at home or whether they're playing away. And finally, we're going to look at um, how we can compare variables and if we should look deeper at a couple of different variables. All right, so without further ado, let's dive in and look at this project. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. This is a project that's in our exploratory data analysis course. It's in our data scientist fun, data science fundamentals skill path. It's in a lot of um, really key like foundational concepts for data science. Um, so. So this data was originally sourced from 538's analysis of the complete history of the NBA. 538 is a statistics journalism um, organization that does a lot of work on specifically sports and politics. They cover science and arts and a lot of other topics, but they focus mostly on sports and politics. That's where both hypothesis testing and predictive analytics come in handy. No matter what, they have to figure out what variables they want to work with. So without so we're gonna dive in and see how they might do something like that. Okay, so we are going to work with their data set. You can learn a lot more about the data set here. In this data set that they've created, they've put in a forecast prediction. So they've already created their own proprietary internal algorithm to figure out who, who might win a match, right? So this is their work. We're gonna test um, whether their work uh, um pans out or not okay so first thing that we're going to do whenever we're working with data is we're going to import numpy and pandas you might see as np and as pd these are what we call aliases oh no i lost my connection anyhow an alias is because programmers are lazy i don't want to type out the entire word pandas i want to type out just pd um so every time i'm calling something i'm just going to write pd rather than the whole word so that's what these, these aliases do for us. 
anytime you're working with data, you're going to want to have NumPy and you're going to want to have Pandas because there's incredibly powerful um, tools within both of them to work with what we call a data frame. So as you are diving into your first data science projects, you're going to see data frames come up a lot. It's really a special way to organize a data set. Um, and it's a special way that Pandas stores a data set. It looks a lot like a table. It's actually what you're seeing right here. Um, so it has some specific features that we're not going to dive in too much here. Um, but I do encourage you to take our Pandas course if you want to learn a lot more about those features. Anyhow, OK. So we are also going to import the Pearson's R, which we're going to use to test the association, and a chi-squared contingency. Oftentimes, you wouldn't import these until much later in your code, because you wouldn't necessarily know that that's what you're going to want to use. But we know it early on, so we're importing it right up at the top. The other thing we're going to work with is matplotlib, because we want to make some plots, and seaborn, because we want to make some nicer plots. Finally, we have this import code Academy lib3. You don't have to worry about that if you're doing this project off platform, because that is a package that just helps translate when we're within the code Academy, code Academy environment. Um, finally, I've set these print options that just tells um, how that just tells my code how I want to see these things output. Um, okay, so we have here in our files this NBA games CSV. We have actually shortened that file so that everything runs a little bit faster. Um, we've only included five teams. Um, there's only a few years worth of data in it. Okay, so we've loaded this in for you. Um, set this we've loaded in this csv as a data frame and we've called that data frame nba so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to separate out just 2010 and just 2014. we're looking at these two years strategically to be completely transparent um, because they illustrate some things that we really want to be able to talk about within this project okay so the way that i am subsetting for 2010 is I'm making a brand new data frame. I'm calling that new data frame NBA 2010. And that's just for me, so I know that it's the 2010 data. And I'm saying, take this entire data frame and find only where the year of the data frame is equal to 2010. Okay, so it says, take this column year ID and find only 2010, right? But give me back all of the columns of the data frame just filter for these rows. I did the same thing here for 2014. I said, give me the whole data frame, but only the rows where the year is equal to 2014. Okay, And then I'm going to look at the head of both of these. I save that. And what I see here is our data frame. Now let's take a quick look and see how this data is organized just to give us a mental model to go forward. Okay, So we have an ID, a unique identifier. We have a unique identifier for the game. Um, this looks like it's probably a concatenation of a lot of different things, but this is probably unique and it's going to tell me um, exactly what game that is. Um, I have the year. We already used that to filter for only 2010. I have franchise ID. So this looks to me like the name of the team. And interestingly, we have opponent franchise. So that is who they were playing. This tells me that everything is going to be in relationship to this franchise ID. It doesn't necessarily mean that that was the home team or the away team, just that this is who everything else is in relationship to. Okay, so we have that the franchise ID here is Celtics, and they were playing the Cavaliers and it was a way. So it was a way for the Celtics. We can assume usually that that means it was home for Cavaliers, but not always, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that the Cavaliers were playing in their home stadium. Um, it just means that it was no noted away for the Celtics. Is it a playoffs game? No. The Celtics scored 95. The opponent scored 89. So here we're like, okay, we actually are centering this around the Celtics. The Cavaliers are secondary. The, the Cavaliers are just the opponents and they scored 89 points. 
it was a win for the Celtics. Um, 538 had forecast it as about 28% chance of winning. And it looks like there was a six point difference. Okay. So it looks like both of our data frames are organized the same way as they should be since they're coming from the same original data frame. So that's just a good mental model for us to have. All right. So now suppose that we want to compare the Knicks to the Nets. We're in New York. We're like, okay, I want to know about the Knicks and the Nets, everybody who's local, um, with respect to points earned per game. So we're going to use the points column from our 2010 data frame to create Knicks points 2010 and Nets points 2010. Okay. So I am going to actually. I pre-wrote the code. Um, an important thing to do whenever you're teaching something live, pre-write your code. You don't want to see me make typos. It's not fun. Okay. So we have Nick's points 10. We have our NBA 2010 data frame. That's the one we made up here that's filtered just for 2010. And I have only where the Knicks are the franchise. And I only want the points column. So I did the same thing I did up there but I'm saying only the points column. And I'm going to do the same thing for the nets, right? So I say NBA 2010, only where the franchise ID is equal to the nets. So I want only those rows where the franchise is the nets. I want the whole data frame, but now I say at the end, give me only the points column, right? So if we work this from the inside out, we say only those rows. And then on the outside, we say, give me everything, Oh, I changed my mind. Just give me the points, right? I'm going to back up just a little bit and point out something that is really common that I forgot to go over before. Okay. So here I've written this code about the 2010 um, filtering for 2010 and 2014, two different ways. So I could show you the two ways to filter your columns. So very commonly you'll see us use dot um, notation. This means that I take the data frame and I put a dot here and then I specify which column. There's a second way that you're going to see and it's super common and it took me a really long time to figure out why things were written two ways. The reason why there's two options is that this is short and I am lazy. This, if rather than having year underscore ID, we had your space ID, we wouldn't be able to use dot notation because there'd be a space here. So that would create a mess, right? If there was a space here, I could still use what's called bracket notation because I put the I put the name of the column in quotes and then I put a bracket to say, give me this column from this data frame. So what that means is that this is exactly the same as this. The reason there's two is to account for when you might have a space in your column name. Okay, cool. All right, so we've done that here and we've gotten our next points and our next points. I'm going to save it. And I'm gonna check off that task and say, I'm done. Okay, so now I might wanna know what the difference is between the mean points of the next and the mean points of the nets in 2010, right? On average, what's the difference, right? So I have, the mean of this Nick's points 10, which is this series that we created. A series is just a one column data frame or one column of a data frame. And then I have, and then I'm saying, give me the mean, calculate what the average is. Same thing with the next points. I have the series, I wanna calculate the mean, and then I wanna take, subtract them and find the difference. I'm gonna print that. And it looks like I have 9.73. Based on this, do you think that the franchise and the number of points are associated? Maybe there might be something to that. Okay. Um, but maybe not. I actually don't have enough information to figure that out. So I'm going to move on to the next. Okay. Rather than comparing means, it can be very useful to look at the full distribution um, to understand whether a difference in means is meaningful. Pun, like, 
whatever. That was intended. Is the difference in means meaningful? Um, so we're going to create a set of overlapping histograms that can be used to compare the points scored for the NICs to the points scored for the NETs. Okay. So we're going to use the series that we already created. So this NICs points 10 series, that's that one column data frame, the NETs points 10 series, one column, and we're going to plot them against each other. So let's go through here and talk about this code. So I'm gonna use matplotlib and I'm gonna call the histogram function. So it's gonna give me a histogram. I'm gonna say, take the NICs from 2010. That's gonna be the data that I want you to plot on the y-axis. The alpha is going to be 0.8. That just means how see-through it's gonna be. So I want it to be a little bit see-through so I can compare them. Normed is true, so we're going to assume this. Um, on a normal distribution, and then call give it a label of the nets. I'm going to do the exact same thing for the nets, but give it the label of the nets. I'm going to tell it to give me a legend, give me a title of 2010, and then show yourself. Okay. So I'm going to plot that, and then we'll take a look over here and see what we got. All right. So I'm seeing that the nets and the nets have a lot of not overlapping space. The not overlapping space is clustered at two different ends. So I'm going to assume that their points are not associated and that the NICs, the fact that they are different teams, that is what has the association, that there's a relationship there, okay? So I've, I'm gonna check that one off. Now we wanna compare the 2010 games to 2014. Okay, so we've done enough in comparing the Knicks and the Nets. Now we're going to compare 2010 to 2014. Okay, so I'm going to say, I'm going to do all everything that I just did, but I'm going to do it for the 2014. So I have here my 2014 season. I'm going to call just the Knicks and just the points column. 2014 season, just the Nets, just the points column. I'm going to compare their means. Yeah. And then I'm going to plot it. One thing I'm going to back up really quick. I'm going to add this plt.clf. This clears the space. So if your plots are ever appearing on top of each other, you probably just need to call plt.clf and um, make a new canvas. Okay. So we'll go ahead and plot that. And we see very different distributions between 2010 and 2014, right? So in 2010, there is clearly not an association between these two teams. In 2014, it's clear that they're a lot closer. They're performing a lot more similarly to each other. Okay, so for the remainder of the project, we are just gonna focus on 2010. Right, so we're like, okay, what is going on in 2010? The Knicks and the Nets are, you know, they're both New York teams, but they're performing super, super differently. Um, so we want to understand that a little bit better. Okay, so for 2010, we're going to generate side by side box plots for all five of our teams to understand if there's a relationship between them. Okay, so I'm going to clear my field. I'm going to use the Seaborn library. I'm going to call a box plot. And I'm going to say, just give me all of the 2010 data, that entire NBA 2010 data frame. On the x-axis, put the franchise ID. So along the bottom, put the franchise ID. On the y-axis, put how many points? And then show yourself. Okay. So I'll go ahead and save that. And wow, the nets are really doing poorly compared to everyone else. Um, so what we're looking at here is a box plot. And what you see in the middle is the mean. You see one quartile, another quartile, uh, the lowest quartile, the uppermost quartile, and the outliers. Box plots are really great for showing the distribution, especially when you care about outliers. Um, so when there's a lot of overlap between different categories, that means that there's likely an association. When there is uh, something that isn't does not have a lot of overlap, 
there is not likely an association. So the nets are performing way worse than everyone else. So we're going to look at the relationship between these category variable, categorical variables, okay? So we, are, we say, okay, maybe there's something to like wins and losses compared to home and away, right? So maybe when teams are home, they might win more games. There's like a cheering effect, you know, like maybe that could help them out. So let's go ahead and look at our look at a crosstab. So we want to understand if there are if there's a relationship between the game result and the game location. Is there an association between whether they win and lose and if it was home and away? Okay. So let's go ahead and calculate that. And a cross tab is a box of away and home losses and wins, right? So this is just number of times that they lost when they were away, number of times they lost when they were home, number of times they won when they were away and won when they were at home. Wow. So it looks like they did actually win more times when they were at home. It's not sure that there's a strong association there, but there is something that might be worth looking into, okay? But I'm looking at this and I'm like, ah, I don't really understand like the percentages, right? Like I know that there's more losses when they're away than there are wins when they're away, but like, it's really hard for me to do that mental math. I'd rather look at a table of proportions. Okay, so I'm gonna check this one off and I'm going to go next to make it a table of proportions. And what, I, what I'm gonna do here is actually quite clever. So I'm going to take this table of results, right? And this was just the raw counts. And I'm going to divide it by the entire length of the table, right? I'm going to divide it by the entire length of the data frame. Because what I'm saying is each one of these, so to get a proportion, sorry, um, I can take 133 and divide it by the sum of all of these. The easiest way to get the sum of all of these is actually just to take the length of the entire data frame. So that's what we're doing right here. Okay, so I'm going to run that and I get proportions. Now I can see that it's when teams are away, they lose almost 30% of the time. And they only win a little over 20% of the time. When they're home, they win almost 27% of the time and lose about 23% of the time. Still, it's really hard for me to eyeball that. I'm not totally sure if there's an association yet. I'm gonna mark this one complete and go to the next. Okay, so this is where a chi, uh, chi squared contingency test comes in. Chi squared is a statistical test to determine if there's an association between categorical variables, right? What we're looking at are categorical variables, away and home, win and loss. Those are categories, right? Unlike numeric variables or quantitative variables, categorical variables are kind of like bins. I put it into the away bin or the home bin, the win bin or the lose bin. Usually these are described by words. Sometimes we even use numbers to describe categorical variables. So for example, let's say that you are talking about medals at the Olympics, right? And Simone Biles, she won a gold and a bronze. You cannot average those and make a silver. That's because medals or places in a race is a categorical variable, even though it's represented by numbers, right? So if you were looking at places in a race or Olympic medals, you would put it again um, into a chi-square contingency um, test, okay? So we are going to just use the chi-square contingency test that we got out of the package above. Here, it's going to tell us the chi-square value, which is the um, strength of the association, the p-value, so the point out, or the degree to which it's statistically significant, the degrees of freedom, and what we would have expected if there was nothing, um, nothing out of the ordinary, if our null hypothesis was true, right? Okay, so I'm going to call it on the frequency table, not the proportions table. Why? Well, the chi-square chi -square contingency test 
is expecting raw numbers. It is going to do the proportions behind the scenes. Unlike me as a human, this test is not trying to do any mental math, right? So it is expecting you to give it the raw numbers, not the proportions. That might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but here we go. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and run that. Da, 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 da. And what do I get? All right, I get my output down here. It looks like my expected values would have been 119, 119. So here, losses would have been 119, 119, and 106, 106. That's not what we get at all. The value of the chi squared is 6.5. Okay, on its own, that means basically nothing. If you were going to use this test on your own, you would look up what is um, indicative of an association. And you would find that it's around four. So for a two by two matrix, about four is indicative of an association. We're at 6.5. That is much larger. Awesome. We probably have an association. So what this tells us is that there's probably some relationship between winning and losing and being home or away. That's interesting. That tells us not necessarily that we should write a paper like, you know, tell every team to play their games at home, but rather it tells us, hey, there's something here, look a little bit more deeply, right? We haven't necessarily set this up as a hypothesis test, but this is telling us, hey, explore the relationship between those variables because there might be something there. Okay, so I'm going to mark that one off and go to the next one. All right, so cool. We've looked at categorical variables. Now let's look at quantitative variables. What new quantitative variables in this data set are interesting to us? Okay, so I'm curious about this like forecasting that um, 538 did, and if there's some relationship between the number of points and the strength of that forecast, right? So if that forecast was like 0.68, that's pretty close to 50-50. But if that forecast was like 0.9, that's way, way more in favor or way more likely that the other team will win. I'm curious if the strength of that forecast is then borne out by the number of points different that the teams were, okay? So that means that we're going to test the association between two new quantitative variables and use a different test. This is why we imported Pearson's R. We may have already, already realized that, okay? So here, I'm going to use um, I'm going to use the forecast and the points different um, columns, and I'm going to look at the covariance, which means literally, do they vary together? Do they co-vary? Co-vary, um, and we're going to call this our point difference covariance. So I'm going to use the NumPy um, function. COV, which stands for covariance, and I'm going to look at the point difference column, and I'm going to use the forecast column, both from the NBA 2010 data set. So all five teams, NBA 2010, looking at the covariance here. And I'm going to print that out. Okay, so if I'm looking at this matrix, um, which is the margin of victory and defeat, do we think that there's going to be a covariance between these two variables? Well, I do initially um, because I'm seeing them, um, how do we say? Basically because this number is much, much larger than all of the others. Okay, now I'm going to actually, now I'm going to mark that one off and I'm going to test this statistic because it's one thing for me to eyeball it and it's another for me to use an actual um, statistical test on it, okay? So here I'm going to calculate the Pearson's R, um, which is a way to test the association between two quantitative variables, okay? And the variables I'm gonna look at are the forecast and the point difference. I'm gonna run that. And here I have it that the forecast is 0.44 and the degree to which it is statistically significant is 9.4 to the negative 23rd. This means to me that they 
definitely are um, associated, that there's a very strong association um, and it is slightly positive. So zero would mean no association um, and one would be a very strong um, positive association. So it looks like there is an association here um, and the degree to which we are confident in that is very, very high. So um, I'm going to mark that off. But again, it's still really hard for me to think through that or to visualize it. So I'm going to generate a scatter plot. Um, and that should give me a little bit more of a visual in the relationship between whether a team is home or away and whether they win or lose. So we'll go ahead and plot that. Here we're using the matplotlib scatter plot. On the x axis, we're putting the point difference. On the y axis, we're putting the forecast. And the data that we're using is the NBA 2010 data set. Um, we'll label our x axis forecast wind probability. Wait a minute. This is, these are flipped. So sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to move this one up here and move that down there. I'm going to save it and. Oh, I probably, you see how I have these dots right here? You know what that means? It means that I did not clear my field up here. So now I'll save it again. And our box plot looks good again, and our scatter plot looks good again. Okay. So the forecasted wind probability, um, we have a couple of outliers here. You know, this one was highly forecasted to win, and there was a huge point differential. Um, this one was, you know, kind of a mid, but the point differential was really extreme to the, um, that the reference team lost. Um, so there's some interesting features going on here. It's not an obvious, like, straight line, like we might have expected, but this is what about a 0.5 um, correlation looks like. It looks like there's a little bit of an association, but it's not super, super, um, strong. It's not like they're all very close to this regression line. Okay. So if you were to do a project like this, you would then write up a summary um, and publish it on something like your personal website or GitHub or something along those lines saying that, yes, we should look more deeply at the relationship between game result and game location. And yes, we should look more deeply about um, home or away and wins and losses. All right. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey and looking at this project with us. Um, let us know down in the comments if you have any questions and we look forward to seeing you at our next live stream. All right, take care, bye-bye.